On July 6, 2014, the Associated Press ran a story that said, keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, says Pope Francis. Is that really true? Is this part of Bible prophecy? Does this have anything to do with the mark of the beast? That's our topic on the Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. A thousand years before there was a Protestant, there were Sunday laws that originated in pagan sun worship. For centuries, the church ruled the world until the Protestant Reformation. Men like Martin Luther championed personal and religious freedom. Thousands fled to America to seek freedom from religious tyranny. Will Protestants and freedom-loving Americans fight to keep freedom alive, or will we descend into a modern dark age? The Sunday Law Crisis, what you need to know. Episode 1, Revelation 13 Explained. Here are some recent headlines. Fox News, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. Time Magazine, and on the seventh day we rested, saying that blue laws were a gift. Newsmax and CNN, Arizona State Senator make Sunday said, make Sunday church attendance mandatory. USA Today, tightrope, better take a break or you'll break down with an article that talks about stores being closed on Sunday. ABC News, German court enforces day of rest. Germany's highest court strictly enforces day of rest and bans Sunday shopping. The Guardian, slow Sunday, the simple solution to global warming. It says in the, uh, right below the headline, using Sunday as a day of rest and renewal would be good for our personal health as well as the health of the planet. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other headlines that we can share. Uh, Tim, Tim Saxton, praise the Lord that you're here with me. Uh, God bless you. We've done programs together before, and I think this is probably the biggest that we've ever done. The last headline I read from The Guardian talked about Sunday being a solution to global warming. Uh, talk to us about the Pope's 183-page encyclical that release, was released uh, June 18, 2015. Yes, Pope Francis uh, issued an encyclical on the environment. You know, the world leaders have been grappling with the whole issue of the environment and climate change for years, and Francis finally weighed in on it. And uh, <clears throat> in his encyclical, he talked about working together for the common good. And, and that's a quote, the common good. Let's remember that because we'll come back to it. Okay. But in his encyclical, Francis mentions that God gave the seventh-day Sabbath in the Old Testament as a day of rest and he pointed people back to rest. He laments in the encyclical the busyness of society today, and in the end, he brings it together with this quote, Sunday is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. And he brings Sunday out as the day of rest for modern society, that whereas you had the Sabbath, he says in the Old Testament, he says, Sunday is the day today that we should all be coming together, and that coming together on Sunday, he says, will give us greater concern for nature and for the poor. And, and it's, it's important to realize that this man who put this encyclical together is currently the most popular pl uh, person on the planet. He's the most, uh, he has the most influential Twitter account, and that encyclical was released in languages around the world. It's being read by legislat legislative people and uh, government people and... Uh, laymen alike. It's just, it's made a big splash. It has made a big splash. Francis has an agenda on the encyclical, and he is pushing hard at the agenda with nations around the world. And people are, by and large, joining him in wanting to push his agenda forward. Including President Obama. The day that the encyclical came out, President Obama made a statement that the United States must lead out in helping to implement the Pope's suggestions in the encyclical. Right. Now, doesn't that bring us to a text in Revelation 13? Yes, and that's what we want to focus on. We want to give just a quick overview of the book of Revelation, chapter 13, so we can understand what all of this means in the light of Bible prophecy. Tim, as you know, uh, Revelation 13, verse 1, talks about a beast. John said, Then I stood, a, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This beast has various characteristics. In verse 5, he has a mouth speaking great things. In verse 7, he makes war on the saints. He is given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nations. Verse 8 says, all that dwell upon the earth will eventually worship this beast. And verse 3 says that all the world would marvel and follow the beast. 
Now we've done a lot of study on this and it's uh, significant to realize that for hundreds of years Protestant scholars and leaders like Martin Luther who founded the Lutheran Church, John Wesley who founded the Methodist Church, uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist pastor in London, uh, John Calvin who founded the Presbyterian Church, uh, Matthew Henry's famous Bible commentary which is the most widely respected commentary in the world that pastors look to regularly, uh, all of these men and countless others interpreted this prophecy as a reference to the Roman Catholic Church, that the beast was a symbol of the Church of Rome. Now, I don't believe uh, they thought, and I don't believe, and I don't think you, I know you don't believe that this is a reference to individual Catholic people, but it's a system that for a long time has really been at war with basic Bible truth. So we have the first beast that's described in Revelation 13. And then we have another beast, a second beast. There's the sea beast and the earth beast. In verse 11, John wrote, I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. In Daniel 7 verse 23, the Bible's very clear that a beast represents a great power, a great uh, nation. The Roman church is a religio-political organization and here's another nation rising up out of the earth. And when you put these pieces together, he comes out of the earth or wilderness area. He has two horns representing a separation of power. These horns do not have crowns like the first beast does, which uh, crowns represent kingly power. So this beast does not have kings, but its leaders are elected through democratic processes. It has two horns like a lamb, showing it has mild Christian features. Jesus in the Bible is called the lamb, and yet eventually it will speak like a dragon. Not only that, but in verse 16, uh, it eventually becomes a superpower. It says he causes all to receive this mark, this mark of the first beast, and buying and selling is involved. And so uh, the second beast eventually gains the clout to affect the world's economy. And when you put these pieces together, the first beast represents the greatest religious power on the earth, the Vatican. The second beast represents the greatest nation on earth, which is the United States. It just fits perfectly. And the Bible says that both of these beasts will be cooperating together at the end of time. Verse 12 says that the first beast will come back into power at the end times. He will have a deadly wound that will be healed. And verse 12 says, the second beast will cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, just to let uh, people know, our viewers know that Whitehorse Media has a couple of books that go into detail. We don't have time to go into all the details that we know of this prophecy, but we have a little book called The Antichrist Identified that talks about the first beast and another one called The United States in Bible Prophecy that deals with the second beast. And as you go down to the end of this chapter, the Bible says that the, the two will cooperate and the second beast representing America will eventually enforce the mark of the first beast. Now, we need to talk about that mark because it is very significant in the light of prophecy. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. And actually, I don't really need to read so much from Exodus 20, but Exodus 20 describes the Ten Commandments. And I've got some real tables here of the Big Ten that God wrote with his own finger. Exodus 31 verse 18 says that God wrote this law, the Big Ten, with his own finger on two tables of stone. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 zeroes in on the fourth commandment, number four, that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then it says that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. And God wrote this with his own finger on stone. And Tim, as we have looked at these issues, we've concluded that the law of God is more important than the traditions of men. True. The law of God is uh, above all the laws of men. And it's very clear in the New Testament, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that the Bible Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, which is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And the first day of the week is the day that Jesus Christ rose. And yet, when you read the Bible carefully, the resurrection of Christ does not change the law of God. And in fact, Jesus addressed that issue, didn't he? He did. And in fact, if, if you look at the Bible Sabbath, Steve, in Exodus chapter 20, like you were quoting from, refers us back to creation, that the Sabbath actually started in creation, the seventh day Sabbath, when God rested. 
And you see the Sabbath throughout the Old Testament. When Christ came in the New Testament, Luke 4.16 says it was his custom to go to church, to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Mark 2.27 says he is a Lord of the Sabbath. In the book of Acts, we find the disciples keeping the Sabbath with both Jews and Gentiles. It wasn't a Jewish day, it was something for all creation. In Isaiah 66, the Bible makes it clear that in the new earth, when sin is gone and everything is recreated, from one Sabbath to another, everyone will come before the Lord in worship. So we see the Sabbath as something God gave to all His creation before there was sin, all through this time of sin, and it will still continue to be a special time of worship when sin is no more. But then that brings us to uh, the just, tradition just, of man. Just one quick question. You mentioned Mark 2.27. I think that was a misquote. Uh, Mark 2.27 says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And verse 28, actually, Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord of the That's Sabbath. That's right, right. That's right. So when you put the pieces together, and Jesus said he's Lord of that day. Now, let's take a quick look at Matthew 15. I was reading this recently about the issue of tradition versus the law of God. So why don't you just uh, give us a quick, and I'll contribute to this. Matthew chapter 15 deals with the issue of tradition right. versus commandment. Well, the Jewish leaders came to the disciples with the question, how come your master, how come, how, they came to Jesus with the question, how come the disciples do not wash the way we do That's before right. we eat? And it wasn't just washing your hands like we think of today. It was a ceremonial washing. Right. It was a tradition, it was of, a tradition of the elders, of the Bible says right. there. And Jesus turned it around with a question to them. He says, well, why do you transgress the command of God, commandment of God by your tradition? Because in the fifth commandment, Steve, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Right here is right here. Honor your father and mother. But the priests and Pharisees of Christ's day had come up with a way around the fifth commandment where people could call it Corbin, say it's dedicated to the temple, and they wouldn't have to contribute to their aging parents. They could give it all to the priests and leaders in the temple. And so Jesus confronted them with the fact that they got around the commandments of God in order to honor their tradition. That's right. And do, do we see any of that today? Yes, we do. And to me, Tim, one of the most significant things of that passage in Matthew 15 is in verse 4, Jesus said, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. So Jesus stood for the commandment of God, the fifth commandment. And then in verse 5, he said, But you say, showing how they were using their traditions to get around what God said in the fifth commandment. And then he brings his punchline in verse 9, in vain they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So when it comes to Jesus Christ himself, when it comes to the issue of tradition versus the commandments of God, Jesus is very clear that God commanded us to keep his commandments. And what applies to the fifth commandment also applies to the fourth commandment, that it is, it is tradition that has brought in Sunday as a day of rest. Uh, history shows us that the Roman Catholic Church changed the Bible Sabbath from Saturday into Sunday. In fact, I've got a copy of the Catechism of the Roman Church. This is called the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, published in 1946, uh, written by Reverend Peter Geierman. It's got the Catholic Im imprimatur on it, and on page 50, it says, question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And there's a whole uh, long history behind all of this, but it is a fact that the Roman Church has changed that day and they claim that day as their, as their own. The reason, I'm sorry, in fact, they do not just claim the day of their own, but they, encourage their members to seek le legislation to keep the day holy. In the, the New Converts Catechism in 2188, it says, in respecting religious liberty and the common good, remember we mentioned that earlier, yes. the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays as legal holidays. So the church just doesn't, they didn't just change the Sabbath to Sunday, according to the, their word, but they're telling, they're saying this should be enjoined upon everybody. That's right. And now the history behind this is uh, quite interesting. We have a book, Whitehorse Media sells a book called Sunday, the Origin of Its Observance in the Christian Church, written by E.J. Wagner. This book goes into great detail. It demonstrates that the, the switch from the Bible Sabbath to Sunday in the early Christian centuries was connected to hostility to Jews, number one, compromises with pagan sun worship, number two, 
And then they rationalize this switch with the idea that, well, hey, Jesus Christ rose on Sunday anyway. So that was the big rationalization. Now, not only that, but here is a statement from one of the most famous Catholic cardinals uh, of the 1800s, American Catholic cardinal. He said through his chancellor, C.F. Thomas, in an official letter dated November 11, 1895, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious matters. I have a big Bible here that I've, somebody gave this to me. It's a very old Bible that used to belong to a Presbyterian lay preacher. And this is very interesting that on, in the prophecy of Revelation 13 about the mark of the beast, it says in the footnotes, and this was a Presbyterian view, it says under the heading of a mark, a mark is submission to the rites and ceremonies of the papal communion. In their right hand, that means active obedience to the papal power. In their foreheads, that means, act, that means outward profession of its doctrines and infallible authority. So here's the, uh, the Bible of a, of a lay pre Presbyterian preacher, and right there in the footnotes, it shows the Protestant position that the mark of the beast has something to do with submission to the papal power. Uh, here's a statement from the Lord's Day Alliance. This is a statement that just came out recently in April of 2015, and it's called, the title is Sunday as a Mark of Christian Unity. Now we have a, another little book on this from Whitehorse Media called Decoding the Mark of the Beast. We have another little book that explains the truth, it says, of the Sabbath, discovering the lost Sabbath truth. Both of these books explain what the Bible says about the Sabbath, it explains about Sunday, and it explains how the Catholic Church, in their claim to be the true church, they actually say, we change the Sabbath into Sunday, and it is a mark of our authority in religious matters. They basically say, nobody else could do it, we did it, and this shows that we're the true church. And our response is, it does not show that you're the true church. It shows that, biblically speaking, you are the beast of prophecy and that you are doing exactly what prophecy predicts. And we know from the study of history and the study of the Bible that eventually uh, this mark of Rome's authority is going to be enforced around the world. I also have another book here called Dateline Sunday USA, the story of three and a half centuries of Sunday law battles in America by an attorney named Warren Johns. And it's a fact, isn't it, that Sunday has been enforced throughout history. Uh, it started with Constantine in 321 AD. Sunday has been enforced throughout European history in various ways. British history, there were Sunday laws, uh, especially early colonial America, there were Sunday laws. And prophecy predicts that at some point, and we can see the stage being set right now, that Sunday will be enforced as a supposed solution to a global crisis to help affect uh, God's uh, response to the earth and climate change and, and uh, cut emissions and a whole host of things. But really, this is going to be a massive deceptive solution to a global crisis that is fulfilling prophecy uh, as the mark of the beast. It is. It's very flawed thinking, Steve. Very flawed thinking. And I think you had, you had some points on the three flaws in, in in the people's thinking that's bringing this about. Yes, Sunday legislation has three major flaws. Number one is obviously it's the wrong day. The first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose, but that does not change the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus stood up for the commandments, not tradition. And so it's the wrong day. Number two, it's uh, force. God never uses force to compel people to obey him. And number three, it is a violation of the United States Constitution. I have a copy here of the Constitution of the United States that starts out saying on the top, we the people, we the people. And the First Amendment of our Constitution says in the Bill of Rights, number one, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That the United States forbids government to enforce religion. But if you look at history, that's exactly what the Roman Church has done. The Roman Church has enforced religion. The Roman Church is a church-state combination. Mm -hmm. America is a church-state separation. The prophecy in Revelation 13 says that America the two horns will come together, an image of the papal power will be created in America, and it will then enforce the mark of the papal power. And we can see that that is, it's lining up right in front of our eyes. It is. Now, now some of our viewers might ask, well, how could there ever, how could people in America ever support Sunday legislation? 
You know, and that, that may come as a question from some of our viewers. And I think we should go to Revelation chapter 13. There's a text in there that shows us how this comes about. Yes. Why don't you read it? Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 says, And, and deceives them, talking about the, the second, second beast. beast power, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. Miracles. People can be, see, be deceived by miracles, Steve. You know, the Bible talks about that Satan himself will appear as an angel of light. Now, <clears throat> as Protestants, we always stand upon the Bible and the Bible only, that we judge everything by the Bible. But the world we live in has gotten away from the Bible so much that when miracles appear, when angels appear, when dearly departed loved ones appear and say, and work miracles, and the miracles are not in accordance with the Word of God, people are more likely to follow miracles than the Word of God if they're not grounded in what the Word says. That's right, and those dearly departed loved ones are really not dearly departed lo no, loved not. ones. No, they're not. They are not. impersonating spirits, uh, spirits of devils who are working to deceive people as this crisis builds to support the keeping of Sunday. Here's another uh, passage in Revelation 19, verse 20, that talks about the beast, the first beast and the second beast, the second beast who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. So this tells us that as this uh, development and crisis continues to unfold on planet Earth, that we're gonna see a lot of miracles that are coming from devils to deceive people, to convince them, hey, Sunday really is the right day. If you don't keep Sunday, you're going against the common good, you're going against uh, what's best for the planet, you're going against God. But the reality is those uh, ghosts are lying through their teeth. They are. You know, there was an interesting story some years ago in the state of Oregon where some women became involved with what they described as angels. And they followed what these angels said till these angels told them one day that they needed to go and do somebody in to commit murder. And unfortunately, these ladies went and did that very thing and were arrested and apprehended. And uh, they were following the wrong angels. Deceptive angels. Deceptive Fallen angels. Fallen angels. Anytime, anytime something goes against the word of God, even if an angel from heaven or someone who looks like your dearly departed loved one appears and says, this is the way, it's not the way if it goes contrary to the word of God. And the miracles they will have power to do will be convincing people of the counterfeit day. You know, everything that God does, Satan has a counterfeit. Sunday is the counterfeit day. That's right, and miracles are gonna support that. Now let's go to the judgments. We've got yes. a little bit of time left, Tim. We're running out of time. Uh, Hosea chapter four, verse two, talks about how God had a controversy with people in the land, and there was killing, lying, and committing adultery, and stealing, and that people were breaking the law of God. And all these calamities that are increasing, people are going to attribute, attribute that to, to keeping Sunday, or not keeping Sunday. Right. But the Bible says that calamities and judgments are going to be coming because uh, humanity has been breaking the Ten Commandments and sinning on all sides. Right. I think about Isaiah 24, 5 says, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Right, now, it's, Tim, we've got four minutes. Talk about the judgments that we need to warn people are coming upon the cities. Absolutely. You know, uh, we are told in uh, the book, Last Day Events, to secure popularity and patronage, legislator, legislators will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When this prophecy comes true, when the United States passes a national Sunday law, national apostasy, we're told, will be followed by national ruin. In history, when nations would totally repudiate the law of God and go opposite of that, then judgments would come upon those nations. So the same thing will happen to the United States. Judgments will fall upon the United States, including on the cities of the United States, when this law is passed, and those judgments will be falsely attributed to those who aren't honoring Sunday. And so they'll ratchet the, the persecution even deeper because they're thinking these judgments are coming because we're not honoring Sunday. But it's really because the law of God has been violated. That's we, exactly we know that right. Recently, the uh, Supreme Court made a decision concerning the issue of marriage, and that marriage was made by God on the sixth day of creation work, creation week. The seventh day came next, and we're going to see the same violation of, uh, of God's principles and his commandments 
from the Supreme Court and from courts around the world. The United States will lead out and it will spread out around the world. And the ultimate issue is that God's law is being violated by the governments of the world. And judgments will follow. Uh, God is a merciful God, he's a loving God, but he's a just God. And when national assemblies officially endorse the violation of God's law, promote Sunday, enforce Sunday, and even start persecuting those who don't go along with this, this uh, apparent solution to a global crisis, global warming, trying to get everybody together to focus on families and religion and God and, uh, and coming back to God, those who don't go along with this are going to be in big trouble. But we've got to follow the Bible. We've got to follow what the Word of God says. And there is a final message in Revelation 14 called the three angels' messages. And in verse 9 to 12, we have the message of a third angel. The Bible says in verse 9, the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, which is a duplication in America by the United States of papal principles and then the enforcement of a papal day upon the people and receives his mark, that's the mark of Rome's authority, it's usurped authority, on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God. There's a solemn warning. Don't follow the beast. Don't follow the second beast who makes an image of the first beast. Don't go along with the mark of the beast in the forehead or the hand. The forehead represents the mind where we yield to this and believe it. The hand represents the actions where people go along with it and do it. And the pressure is going to be on, but at the end of verse 11, it talks about those who receive the mark of his name. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God as God gave them and wrote them with his own finger on stone and the faith of Jesus. Jesus is the last uh, word before the period at the end of the third angel's message. And from all the study that I've done, I've done a lot of research onto this, the Bible's very clear that the finger that wrote the law on stone was on a hand that was nailed to a cross that Jesus Christ gave his life. He, he gave his life for the world, for all the sins of breaking God's commandments. And he is offering us full forgiveness, his grace, his love, and his power to help us to become commandment keepers. We've got more to come as we continue to talk about the Sunday Law crisis. And it is our prayer that you will choose to follow Jesus and to follow the Bible and not the beast.